thank you for joining us for Trinity Gardens Wednesday evening Bible study. And we're just so glad that you decided to join us for our Bible study session here tonight. Uh, we ask you to get your Bibles ready, uh, gather everyone in your house that's there as we prepare to study a portion of God's word. But before we start, of course, always, let's start off with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for in this Bible study time, we ask that you will be with us and, and that you will bless us, Father God. And we just pray that uh, your word will leave here and will not return unto you, Lord. Help me, Father, as I present your word, that I will do so in a manner that's pleasing and that's acceptable to you. We thank you for the audience for taking of their time to listen to your word and to study themselves to see whether or not the things that they're hearing it's written upon the pages of inspiration. We praise you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, we thank you for being with us tonight. And uh, our study tonight will come from the book of Acts, uh, the chapters number nine. Uh, and we'll uh, start off by reading verses number one and two. Acts chapter nine. I'll start off by reading verses number one and two. What the Bible says, and Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, and he desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bound them and bring them back to Jerusalem. You know, we see at this point in Saul's life, Saul was a persecutor of the church. He was a zealous uh, individual, uh, but his zealousy was, 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 was not guarded in the right direction. Uh, but before we get too deep into our story, because we're going to find out that tonight uh, Saul's whole direction will be changed. And, and if I could tag this lesson with a, a title, I will title it tonight that your past does not define your future. And that's the message that I want to keep emphasizing over and over, that your past does not define your future. You know, I know at some point in your life, we all have felt weighed down by the past. At some point, we all have made mistakes. We all have made failures. We all have had regrets. At some point, we all have done some things that we wished we would not have done. And sometimes we even feel like we're chained to our history, that we're unable to move forward, that we're unable to go through the future because of what we've been to in the past. It's as if we're driving a car and the road ahead is clear, and our destination is in front of us, but we keep looking back through the rearview mirror, looking back through the windshield, having our eyes fixed on the things that behind us, constantly staring at what's behind, those old roads that we've traveled on, those old bumps that we've gone over, those old red lights that we passed way back there, I just want you to know this morning, class, that it's not possible to drive forward safely if we keep looking back. In life, sometimes some of us actually get stuck looking back at our past failures, back at the regrets, back at the sins. And because of that, we find it difficult to move forward. But just like driving, if I will focus, or if you focus, or if I focus, if our focus is too much on the past, we will miss what's right in front of us. We might miss the opportunities, we might miss the blessings, and we might miss the growth that God has for our future. I remember the scripture said, and Paul said it in Philippians to chapter number three, beginning with verse number 13, he said, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, I strive for what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize 
for which God has called me in Christ. And, and I just want you to remember today that your past does not have to determine your future. I remember a story once upon a time about a little frog named Freddie. And, and Freddie lived in a swamp. And, and Freddie wasn't like the other frogs. He, he was a little deformed. His, his legs wasn't grown up like the other frogs. And so he couldn't jump quite as high. He could jump, but he could only jump about an inch off the ground. The other frogs used to make fun of him because they jumped four or five inches off the ground and they would laugh at Freddie. And so Freddie just determined as time goes on that he's just not supposed to jump. And so he stopped trying to jump. And you would just see Freddie walking everywhere. The other frogs are jumping around. Freddie just wouldn't jump at all because he had determined that because he couldn't jump in the past, he could not jump now in the future and he would be able to jump. I mean, he could not jump now in the present and he would not be able to jump in the future. But one day after the story goes, a bumblebee named Buzz flew by Freddie and looked at him and said, Freddie, why are you so sad? Freddie said, well, really because I just can't jump. You see all the other frogs over there, they're jumping high and I'm, I just can't do that. And, and, and Buzz asked him, well, how do you know you can't do it? And Freddie said, well, I've tried and I've tried and, and, and it's just been, been too long and I just can't do it. Buzz told him, Freddie, close your eyes. Freddie closed his eyes. Buzz flew around him and stung him in the behind. Freddie jumped up about five feet in the air, higher than any of the other frogs had ever jumped. You see, the moral is all Freddie needed was a little motivation. In our text, we must understand tonight that God has the power to take our mess that we have made and give us the motivation to transform us into something beautiful. You might say, well, preacher, you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've been through. You don't understand the pains that I have. You don't know my past. Well, all that is true. I don't know your past, but I do know God. And I know that with God, your future could be full of hope and full of new possibilities. With God, you can be just like Freddie. You can find your jumping legs in Christ. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and the verse number 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and the new has come. You see, the Bible lets us know that we all have fallen short. We all have missed the mark. We all have done things that we weren't supposed to do. But our past don't determine who we are once we get into Christ. This verse in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 speaks directly to the heart of our lesson today. Christ has made us new. Our old life, our old baggage, our old sins, no longer holds us captive. Instead, we can step into a new future with Christ as our King. Let's look at Acts, the chapter number nine. We read verses one and two. Let's go continue on and read verses three through six, where the Bible says, and as he, now that's Saul. Now we read at first how Saul was, was, was threatening the church and he even got letters to go and persecute the church. And in verse number three, the Bible says that as he journeyed, he came to Damascus. I want you to understand that Saul was one of the most prominent examples in scripture of how God can transform your life. In verses one and two, we see he was a prosecutor of Christians, actively hunting them down. But yet God had a different plan for him. The Bible says, concluding in verse number three, after he came to Damascus and suddenly there shined around about him a light from heaven. In verse four, he fell down to the earth and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul said, who are you, Lord? And the voice said, 
I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for you to kick against the pricks. Verse number six, and immediately, and, and, and he's trembling and astonished, said, Lord, well, what will you have me to do? You see, Saul on the road to Damascus met Jesus and Jesus changed his whole life. A key to that meeting though was that Saul had to feel bad. He had to repent from what he had done. And he asked, what will you have me to do? Jesus told him, you go into the city and you will be told there what you must do. Sometimes we want to change. Sometimes we want to get better. Sometimes we want to live life differently, but we don't want to do what we have to do. The Bible says again in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, as I read earlier, if you are in Christ, you are a new creature. Now, now God's not going to make you act like a new creature. You can come in Christ and be a new creature and still live the same old life you were living. But God expects you, if you don't want to, your, your, your past to, to, to have an impact or to define your future, when you come to Christ, God wants you to be that new creature. Despite Paul's past, as we see, despite his past as a violent man, a man who persecuted the church, God had a different future in mind for him. Paul will go on to write many of the books in the New Testament. Paul spread the gospel to countless of people throughout the Bible. Paul became a foundational figure in the early church. Paul was responsible for starting over 14 churches throughout the New Testament period. See, Paul did not let his past dictate or define his future. Think about it, a caterpillar. A caterpillar. A caterpillar crawls on the ground. It moves rather slow. It's kind of slimy, if you ask me. It have all them legs. It's really not a pretty looking creature at all. But once that caterpillar spins that cocoon, and, and, and the metamorphosis takes place inside of that cocoon, something incredibly happens. Once that butterfly breaks open that caterpillar, it's a totally new and different creature. He has wings. He no longer has those caterpillar legs. He no longer has that caterpillar hair. He no longer has that caterpillar look. He had beautifully colored wings and he can fly. That's what God says for us. Once we get in Christ, we become a new creation. The past life of crawling for that caterpillar is not defined for that butterfly. That butterfly is in flight. That's the same way God has for us. And he does it through the transformation process. The Bible says in Romans 12, number two, Romans 12, verse two, that we are transformed by the renewing of our mind. That's where Holy Spirit comes in. And so we must remember that first of all, we must give, we must uh, have the new beginnings that God gives. But second, we must understand that it's the forgiveness that we receive that makes us free. Let's move on to another example. Let's leave Saul for a minute and look at a powerful example that we have in David. The Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. We know if you read your scripture that David committed adultery with Bathsheba. David orchestrated the murder of her husband. David sinned and his sin caused him many, many consequences. But class, because David was willing to repent and be forgiven for his sins. See, that's the key. If you hold on to that past, then that past will hold on to you. In Christ, you have the opportunity. I have the opportunity to repent of my sins, to let go of my sins, and those sins will let go of me. David wrote in Psalms chapter 51, 
verses 10 through 12, he said, created me, and he was crying out to God. He said, created me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. David says, do not cast me from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation and grant unto me a willing spirit that will sustain me. When we think about David's story, it reminds us that no matter how deep sin is, God's forgiveness can reach us even in the depths of our sin. You see, David, he number one lusted after another man's wife. Number two, we see David, he abused his power to sleep with another man's wife. Number three, we see David, he impregnated another man's wife. We see David also, number four, he tried to trick that man to come in and sleep with his own wife so that he could think that he got his wife pregnant. And none of that worked. And when all of that work did not work, the cover-up that David tried to do, David again used his power to have the man killed. Now, now you might say, well, that's a whole lot of baggage. That's a whole lot of stuff. But David repented of that, and God forgave him. When we come to God in repentance, he not only forgives us, but class, he also cleaned the slate for us. You don't have to live defined by the mistakes that you made. Imagine with me for a minute that all of your sins were written on a chalkboard. And I know if your sins are like mine, it'd be a pretty big chalkboard. All your sins, everything you've ever did was written on a chalkboard. Well, the Bible does say that there is a book in heaven up in, Reve up in Revelation with everything written on it that we've ever done. But if all of our sins are written on that board, on that chalkboard, and imagine somebody will come up with an eraser and erase all those sins away. That's how it is when God forgives us. It's as if he takes that eraser and he removes all and he wipes all of our sins from that chalkboard for us. Listen at what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 17. The Bible says, uh, and this is the covenant, well, I'll start off with 16. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, said the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and in their minds, and I will write them. And verse 17, this is the clincher. And their sins and iniquity would I remember no more. So since we are in Christ, God said, I'm not going to remember that stuff you did. You say, well, 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 preacher, all the things that I've done, God says it doesn't matter. I'm not going to remember that anymore once you are in Christ. Because you know what? God knows that we all make mistakes. But God has a plan. He has a plan that's greater than our mistakes. Let's look at Peter. And that is the last one. We, we talked about uh, Saul. And we saw how God, how Jesus turned him around on the road to Damascus. We saw how David, with all the stuff that he did, uh, but yet God forgave him of that. But let me make this one point here before we look at Peter. You know, although we are forgiven of our sins, our sins does still carry a consequence. Yes, I know that, 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 that God forgives and, and God will throw it, as we say, it, God will throw our sins into the sea of forgiveness and, and he'll remember our sins no more. But those sins do carry a scar. They do hold a consequence. David's consequence was his, his, his children. Uh, his sins, his children bear the brunt 
of the sins that he had done. So the, see, the stuff that we do, it does not define our future, but it still hurts us, our future, and sometimes it hurts our children's future. But let's look at Peter uh, as we consider and we'll close our lesson with Peter. On the night that Jesus was arrested, you probably know the story very well. Peter denied Jesus three times. Now, earlier, Peter had declared that he would never deny Jesus. And if you turn your Bibles to Luke, I want to just read that passage of scripture uh, for us. I'm going to Luke uh, chapter 22. Uh, and if you wait for me uh, around verse number 20, uh, 33, then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll read the story together. Luke chapter 22, uh, beginning with verse number 33, because Peter was just like some of us, old impetuous Peter. He told Jesus he would never, he would never abandon him. Uh, but Jesus knew otherwise. The Bible says in Luke chapter 22, beginning with verse number 33, and he said unto him, this is Peter talking, and he's talking to Jesus. He said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both into prison and to death. Now, now Peter's saying, look, they, 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 they're getting ready to arrest Jesus. And, and, and Peter knows that Jesus had told him. Peter said, I'll go with you into prison. I'll go with you into death. Jesus says, I'll tell you what, Peter, the cock will not crow three, will not crow this day before you shall deny me thrice or three times. And so Jesus is saying to Peter, before you hear the cock crow three times, you'll recognize that you have denied me this day. And after we see in verse number 56, it came to pass where they were, they've arrested Jesus and they've taken him to a trial uh, and, 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 they are warming themselves and Peter warming himself around the fire. Uh, and, and one of the, the, the maidens that's in the circle, uh, that's in the courtyard, she looks up and in verse number 56, a certain maiden beheld him as he sat by the fire and earnestly looked upon him and said, this was all, this man was also with him. Peter denied him, saying, woman, I know him not. Peter said, I never deny you. That's one. Verse 58, and after a little while, another saw him and said, thou art also one of them. And Peter said, man, I am not. That's two. Verse 59, and about the space of one hour, after another, confidently affirmed, saying of a truth, this fellow is with him, for he is a Galilean, and his speech gave him away. Peter says in verse number six, six, zero, man, I know you not. I don't know what you're saying. And immediately the Bible says, the cock crow. See, Peter said, I never did not you, Jesus. But yet he did. Jesus knew he would. Major mistake that Peter made. But after the resurrection, Jesus did not reject Peter. Jesus did not hold Peter responsible because, again, Jesus showed Peter that your past failures doesn't define your future. Jesus basically restored Peter to his crucial role. Peter's failure did not define him. He was given and restored and commissioned to be a leader in the early church. Class, my point is, that I know we all have done some things, but God in Christ doesn't hold all that stuff against us. When I think about Peter, I kind of think about a GPS. You know, a GPS, you set your destination uh, and then you make a wrong turn. Well, the, the GPS don't start cursing at you and saying, why are you going that way? Why are you going that way? All the GPS does is say, recalculating. And then it'll find you another, it'll find you a different way to get to the same place. Class, we all have a past, all of us. We've all made mistakes, each and every one of us. 
but with God. Our past does not define our future. Just like he transformed Paul, just like he forgave David, just like he restored Peter, he can and he will do the same for you. When you come to him in repentance and in faith, he will take his eraser and he will wipe your slate clean, giving you a new beginning. Think about what Jeremiah said, uh, what God said through the prophet Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 29, 11, God says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and to give you a future. Class, God's plans for you are greater than your past. So stop living in the shadow of yesterday's mistakes. Stop and, and start walking in the light of God's grace. Your future in Christ is one of hope and one of promise. If you're not in Christ, you need to get in Christ. If you are in Christ, you are a new creation. You need to live out your new creation in Christ. Let us pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the truth of our past, that it does not define our future. Thank you, Father, for your grace, for your forgiveness, and for the power that you have to transform us. Help us, Father, to walk in the new life that you offer us and trust in the plans that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. We thank you for being with us tonight. We look forward to seeing you next time for our Wednesday night Bible study class. May God bless you and may God keep you is our prayer. Mm -hmm.